So friends, I am Dr. Avdeet Singh and I welcome you to Un Academy on our free series on ethics for UPSC civil services examiner. Friends, I have been an IRS officer for more than 25 years and I am teaching ethics, integrity and aptitude and other subjects with the teaching experience of 7 years and more. I have written the books of Ethics, Integrity and Aptitude and this is one of the best selling books on this topic. So friends, first of all let's understand what are the challenges of General Studies Paper 4 or Ethics, Integrity and Aptitude. This paper looks very simple but actually if you look into the Mars which has been scored by many people and you, you will find that often some of the highest toppers also turn out to score lower marks or even the lowest marks in the general studies paper 4. Because general studies paper 4 I think integrity and aptitude is not a paper which you can memorize or which you can prepare by road learning. This is a paper where you have to understand the concepts in a very proper manner, in a deep manner. So let's understand that this ethics paper, the general studies paper, is basically consisting of 250 marks, a full general studies paper. And it's very important for us to score good marks in this paper if you want to achieve success in the general studies uh, paper in the civil services examination. Now, ethics is a branch of philosophy. This is something which you must know. It's a branch of philosophy and most students find the philosophy very incomprehensible and difficult. And the reason is that philosophy is not something which is straightforward. It's not like a science or mass. It's not a very accurate uh, science which where you know the yes and no. But you have to decide the things on the basis of the context and that's not very easy thing. And the value of ethics is also because you will find lots of philosophical topic on the essay paper. So if you prepare for your ethics paper well, if you are sound in ethics paper, you have better chances or you can score better marks in essay paper as well. Ethics paper, commonly it's called ethics paper, but ethics paper is not purely ethics. It's about different other topics, for example, you have governance here, you have different type of case studies which are belonging to the uh, corporate sector and the government sector and the personal life. How to solve those case studies? Almost 50% of the syllabus or 50% of the marks are pertaining to the case studies. And if you want to solve the case studies, you require deeper understanding of the functioning of the government system. Because this paper means how to use ethics in the governance. And so you require not only the knowledge of the ethics but also the knowledge of the governance system. Now what is the purpose of this series? In this series we will explain the concept of philosophy, ethics and governance in the simple language. As you know that I was an IRS officer for 25 years and so I have got the deep understanding of how the government system works. And that can be very, very useful to you for solving the case studies. We are going to cover all the important topics of general studies paper 4 or this ethics paper. And we are going to understand the thoughts of important philosophers around the world. So that way we will develop a good knowledge of the philosophy. And once you have the good knowledge of the philosophy, you can tackle not only any type of questions of ethics paper, but also you can tackle essay papers as well. So this knowledge is very, very important for your success in the UPSC. Now, how the series is going to be useful for the UPSC aspirants? We are going to have the best strategies for preparing for S ethics paper. We will comprehensively cover the syllabus 
almost all important topics will be covered. We will cover all those topics and every session will have notes the PDF notes will be provided to all the participants. So that way with this series you join and you can prepare for your ethics paper in the best possible way. Friends, ethics and morality are similar terms and often people get confused between ethics and morality. So what exactly is ethics and morality? So that is what we are going to learn today. So let's begin our class. First of all, what is ethics? The term ethics derives from the ancient Greek word ethikos or ethos, which basically means habit or custom. So first thing you should understand is that ethics is based on the habit and custom of a particular society. So what is considered ethical in one society may not be considered ethical in another society. Now society of different countries are different, but at the same time, even within the same country, there are different societies. The society in the rural area, the society in the urban area, the society in the metros, may be different. When we are going to talk about ethics, we have to find out in which context you are talking because it is pertaining to the habit and customs of a particular society. Ethics is also defined as the branch of philosophy that involves systematizing, defending, and recommending the concept of right and wrong conduct. Now let me make it very, very clear. Friends, the concept of right and wrong come from various sources. For example, religions. Now, religion may tell you, you should not lie. You should always speak truth. You should not do violence. Or you should not drink alcohol. Or you should not eat cow meat. But no religion will tell you why you should not do it. What religion tells you about right and wrong are considered to be the word of God and that everyone must follow. In the same way, the concept of right and wrong can be given in the law also. It can be given by traditions also. The traditions also tells you what is right and what is wrong. Your parents may be telling you what is right and what is wrong. Society may be telling you what is right and wrong. The difference is that in ethics, we not only tell what is right and wrong, but also we systematically present the arguments as to why something is right or why something is wrong. Then whatever argument we present, we defend what we consider is right. We defend by logical arguments, reasons, evidence. And then finally we recommend that under this situation, this is the right thing to do. So ethics is based on reason. It is not based on emotions. It is not based on traditions. It is not based on scripture. It is based on reason. So ethics is basically a set of principles of right conduct, a set of values and principles which help guide behavior, choices, and action. So whenever we do something, then these are the principles which help us doing the right behavior, make the right choices, and take the right actions. So that is what is ethics. It can sometimes also be defined as the ideal human character. It is the science of ideal human character or the science of moral duty. That means if you want to find out what is the right way to live, how an ideal person should be, then ethics can guide us. And that is why the individuals, the people who live to the highest standard of ethics are sometimes compared even with God. You think about a God. God is an epitome of the highest level of ethical behavior. So when we talk about Lord Krishna or Lord Ram, 
they exemplify the ethical behavior. And so, you should remember that if you follow the ethics in your life, then you become an ideal human being. And it is also that is why called the science of moral duty because you will be doing all the things in the moral way. Ethics has also been defined by Cambridge Dictionary of Philosophy, the moral principle of particular tradition, group or individual. Now, always remember that there is no universal concept of ethics which can be applied all over the world. It varies on a particular tradition, a particular group or individual. So, there is a lot of variety over there. Something which is considered ethical in India may not be considered ethical in America. Something which is considered in Delhi may not be considered so much in a uh, rural area. So, you have to always keep into mind that it is basically related to a particular tradition, group or individual. Now, what is the purpose of ethics? Why should we study ethics? Why should we know about ethics? Because you see, ethics basically investigate the questions like what is the best way for the people to live and what actions are right and wrong in a particular circumstances. Whenever we do something, some people may say it is right, some people may say it is wrong. So ethics help us in finding out whether that principle or whether that action is right or wrong. <laughs> ethics basically seeks to resolve the questions of human morality by defining the concepts, for example, what is good and what is evil, what is right and what is wrong, what is virtue and what is vice, and what is justice and what is crime. So these are the different concepts because we all want to be good, we want to be right, we want to be virtuous, we want to be justice, we want to be just. So how can we become good, right, virtuous and just? That is the that is what ethics teaches us. The question sometimes arises, why should we be ethical? Because in our life we often see that there are many unethical people, immoral people who enjoy their life. And we often think that the people who are very ethical and moral, they suffer in their life. So the natural question arises, why should we be ethical? Why should we know what is ethical and what is not? Now remember that in general, ethical conduct is one which is beneficial not only to the individual <clears throat> but also to the society and the nation. See, it is our nature that we take the action which is in our interest. Sometime it may be interest of ourselves and also the family. But a good action is one which is in the interest of not only us, but also the society and nation. In the short term, you may get benefit by doing selfish act, by doing something which benefits you. But if it is against the society, against the nation, then you are going to face the consequence of that. And when the society is going to punish you or the country is going to punish you, then your life will become very, very difficult. Ultimately, we want an action in our interest as well as in the interest of the society and the nation. Ethics is often codified by the organization and prescribed as code of ethics, which may be followed by all the members of the organization. So, not only the society and the nation, <clears throat> when we join any organization, whether it is a government department or a corporate, it already has some code of ethics. And these code of ethics should be followed by all members of the society. When we join that organization, we should follow that. Because if we don't follow that, then we will not be able to achieve the goals which has been set by the organization. We may be working against the organization and we may have to face the consequence for that. Some examples of, uh, you know, the organizational ethics are like medical ethics, business ethics, sports ethics. In every organization, you will find the code of ethics, which all the members must stick to. Ethics sets the criteria for right and wrong, which help exercising the discretion in case of ethical dilemma. Now, ethical dilemma, I will be teaching you later on in details, but right now it suffice to know 
that ethical dilemma is one where you have to make choices which are both ethical. So if you have to choose between ethical and unethical, then there is not a problem because you can always choose the ethical path. But when you have to choose between two ethical paths, then it becomes difficult and that creates an ethical dilemma. For example, if suppose you speak truth and that leads to, let us say, harm to your relative or father or mother or a person, then you have to decide whether speaking truth is better or doing good to other people is better. Because both are ethical. We should also speak truth. We should also help other people and do good to other people. And so that is the ethical dilemma. In this case, what should be preferred? Should we speak the truth or should we try to do good to other people? That will be different upon the case to case. And we will discuss as we will go and discuss the case study. Ethical ethics also provide a moral code which can be uh, followed in the private and public life. And that can be very useful because the people who are ethical are respected in their home, by their friends, by their family members, and also by the society, they get a lot of respect. People who are unethical are respected nowhere, neither in their home, nor in their office or in the society. And therefore, friends, the understanding of the ethics is a way of self-realization and ultimate happiness. So ethics, if we understand, we realize the self because we understand our true human nature. And that way we can enjoy the ultimate happiness. There are people who follow unethical means and they sometimes appear to be very happy also. But if you follow their life, you will find that soon they will be filled with misery and pain, social condemnation, guilt, and they will not have happiness. But if you follow the ethical path, you will enjoy your life, you will understand yourself, your happiness will come from within, and you will have the good life. Ethics has different sources. We learn what is ethical from religion, rules and laws, cultures and traditions, family and friends, schools and colleges, and also by rational thinking. We will be learning more about them and we will discuss about the determinants of ethics. Now let's come to the second important term, what we are going to discuss, and that is morality. Friends, the term morality, it comes from the Latin word moralis which means manner, character, or proper behavior. That means what are the actions which are right, which are considered to be correct, what is proper behavior. So morality is something which, is, which tells us that this is what we should do. It is basically the differentiation of intentions decisions and actions between those that are distinguished as proper and those which are considered improper. So remember the three important terms. What are your intentions? If your intentions are right, sometime maybe by mistake you commit wrong deeds, but then you will be forgiven. But your intention should always be moral and right. Decision. Sometime you take a good decision, thinking that it is the right decision, whether that decision is right or wrong, that will be decided, that will be deciding the proper and improper. If the decision is proper, it will be called moral. If it is considered to be improper, it will be treated as immoral. And same way the actions, which are proper actions, considered to be moral, otherwise it will be considered immoral. Remember that morality is concerned with the principles of right versus wrong that is based on one's own personal feeling, values, and opinion. Now, morality is not only that comes from outside. Of course, we are influenced in the society. Whichever society we live, we are influenced by that. I will be giving you some examples to explain the difference of that. But ultimately, it is our inner feeling. Morality is our own interpretation. 
we decide. It is something not because some philosopher has said so, not because some, uh, you know, law says so, but what we feel from inside. What is our values? What is our opinion? So it is something which is more personal than ethics. Ethics comes from outside. Morality comes from inside. Morality can sometimes be synonymous with goodness or rightness. That means what action is considered to be good, what action is considered to be right, that is what is moral also. The opposite of morality is immoral. For example, if you are having an extramarital affair, that is considered to be immoral. If you are lying, if you are cheating, if you are doing fraud, that will be considered immoral. So opposite of that is morality. When you are truthful, when you are speaking truth, when you are doing honesty, when you are, uh, you know, when you are keeping the trust of the people, you are, when you are faithful, those things are considered moral. Now there are different aspects of morality. Morality is considered as a system of values that provide the set of behavioral rules for the individual and the society. So, in a society, how the people should behave with the individual and how the individual should behave with the society, these are the set of norms which are basically covered in the morality. Morality, remember that unlike the things which come from outside and they are things based on philosophies, morality is something which is very subjective and it varies from person to person. For example, is stealing bread by a poor and hungry man can be cons can be treated as immoral by a fellow person, but moral by a poor man. Now, if suppose there is a very poor fellow, he is very hungry, he doesn't have any food to eat, and he has stolen a piece of bread. Now, from the right person, from the rich person's perspective, it's a stealing, and all stealing is bad. He may consider that bad because he has not known hunger. He doesn't know the pain of hunger. He doesn't know the problem of the poor. But another person who is a very poor, he himself is hungry. From his perspective, such an action may not be considered to be moral. It will not be considered to be immoral. Of course, I'm not saying that it's a good thing to steal. But somebody who is hungry, who is desperate, if he does such action and do such a small theft, you know, like a stealing a bread, that will not be considered to be moral by a person who is very poor. Morality is also related, which depends upon the place, nationality, and society. For example, live-in relationship may be considered immoral in India, but it is not considered immoral in Western countries, it is considered moral in the Western countries. As long as both agrees, both partners agrees, and they are willingly living together, such an action will not be considered to be immoral in the Western countries, but will be considered moral in those countries. Okay, so now let's come to understand the difference between ethics and morality. Now in the tabular form, in the, in the, in the table form, let's understand. Now ethics are something which are codified by the philosopher which can be studied and implemented. So we have, you know, we have code of ethics for medical, we have code of ethics for government services, we have code of ethics for law, because these are developed by the philosopher or the professionals and also we have code of ethics for the society, for the individual, for the married people unmarried people, for the husband, for the wife. But when we talk about the morality, it is fluid and that varies from situation to situation, person to person. But it does not mean that morality and ethics are not connected. When the same sense of morality is crystallized, it is logically explained then it becomes ethics. So morality basically is the source from where the ethics arises. The rule of conduct recognized in respect of a particular class of human actions or a particular group or culture. So that I've already explained that it may pertain to, you know, an organization, it may pertain to a particular society, a particular class of people. But morality is basically a personal compass of right and wrong. You choose your moral based on your personal values. Now, morality is something more subjective. It is influence by the society in which we live. It is influenced by the religion we belong to. It is influenced by our parents, our upbringing, by, so, uh, by the city where we live. But nevertheless, the judgment is totally internal. Because looking into all the factors into consideration, you decide what is moral and what is not moral. 
Ethics refer to the rules which are provided by the external source, that is society, nation, and region. Religion. Moral refers to the individual's own principle regarding right and wrong, and its sources internal. In the same way, if suppose you do something unethical, then social pressures are exerted on the people to follow the ethical behavior. So if you do unethical things in the organization, you may be removed from the organization. If you do something unethical in the society, you may be boycotted by the people. So ethics, there is social pressure, which is exerted to fall you in line. But as far as the morality is concerned, it is based on personal belief following the moral behavior. So here the pressure is not outside. Pressure is inside. If you do something immoral, you feel guilty about doing the wrong thing. And you are punished from within because you feel a guilty feeling. You feel ashamed. Ethics is governed by professional and legal guidelines within the particular time and place. So every organization has a legal guideline, professional guideline. But moral bas morality basically transacts cultural norms and it is quite universal. For example, ethics may say that as a doctor, you must treat even the terrorist. Or as a lawyer, you must not reveal the secret correspondence between the lawyer and the client. That is the professional code of ethics. But morality is not bound by that. That will be decided by the person. Maybe if somebody is a big terrorist, maybe you will not treat him so that you can avoid, you know, him killing many people. So like that, basically it will be something which will be decided on your own side. Maybe that's against the professional ethics, but it will be considered moral by the society, by you, because you have done the right thing in your own eyes. So that is basically the difference between ethics and morality. So friends, with this we conclude the session. I hope that you understand the difference. Now, what is determinants of ethics? What are the factors that determines our ethical values? Now, those are the things which we are going to learn in today's class. Now, in a very simple words, the meaning of determinants of ethics is that the factors that determines the ethical conduct of a person are called determinants of ethics. You must have found that different people have different ethical values. Within the same organizations, some people are ethical, some people are unethical. Within the same family, some people are ethical, some people are unethical. So what are the factors that basically determines the ethical values or the ethical conduct of the person? Those are called determinants of ethics. Now, it has been found that the ethical values of the persons depends on different factors like person, place, law, organization, religion, and time. So let's understand these values. What are the different factors which determine our ethical values? The first important thing is person. Now, every human being is unique and they possess different type of attribute. From the birth itself, the behavior of every person is different because every person is unique. And so, you know that when the ethical values are developed over a period of time, that depends upon nature as well as nurture. Nature is something which is inherent in the child and nurture is something which he gets from the environment in the process of bringing up. So people acquire their ethical values from their parents, their teachers, their elders, depending upon their nature and experience. So the environment in which we are brought up, suppose your parents are ethical, the chances are that you will also be ethical. If you have good teachers and good gurus guide your then you may develop ethical values. If you don't have one, maybe you develop unethical values. In the same way, the elders who are there, they also help you develop the ethical values. But again, it depends upon your nature as well. In the same family, you will find one brother 
or one sister becoming ethical, other becoming unethical, because what you understand from your parents may be different. Sometimes people follow the values of their parents, and sometimes they follow the opposite values of their parents also. It depends upon the nature and attitude. For example, suppose your parents are very honest. Now, you will find that some children will be inspired by their parents and they will become honest. But the other people may see the depravity or the financial constraints because of the honest parents and they may decide that, okay, I am going to be dishonest. In the same way, let us say, there are parents who are abuser or alcoholic or drug addict. Now that can make the children more likely to be drug addict or alcoholic. But then some people may develop, you know, detest for such type of activity, hate it for such activity, and they turn out to become very, very good human beings. So you should remember that these are the factors, you know, that it is not necessarily that you will uh, copy the parents' value. It can be just opposite depending upon your nature. So by this, in the same family, I mean, two people can have different uh, ethical values. And when we go to the school and colleges, then the type of friends we have, the type of company we have, that also is responsible sometimes for developing ethical and unethical values. If we have good friends, we turn out to develop good values. And if we have bad friends, we may end up developing, you know, bad values. The second important factor is place. The culture, the tradition, and the values of the society and country plays a very important role in shaping our ethical values. Where you have been brought up. If you have been brought up in a rural society, your values may be different. Urban society it may be different. North India it may be different. South India it will be different. India it will be different. America it will be different. Pakistan it will be different. So the place where we have been brought up, that is very much responsible for development of our value. Because what is generally considered to be ethical in our society, we tend to accept those values. These values vary greatly in each country and each society. For example, corruption is very common in India, but not so in the developed countries. So in India, suppose somebody's corrupt is not condemned, is accepted. But in the developed countries, corruption is something which is considered to be very bad. And people are criticized if they do corruption. And that's why corruption is not so common in those countries. But if you talk about living relationship, adultery, that means sex outside the marriage, extramarital and premarital relationships, they are very common in Western countries. But it is not in India because in India that is very much condemned. So it's not that, you know, any country can say that, look, we are only moral. No. What is considered to be moral or what our moral values are, that basically depends upon the society. So in India, suppose somebody is corrupt, maybe he will not be considered to be bad or moral. But if somebody is having an extramarital affair, he will be considered to be immoral. The situation may be different. In our industrial countries, suppose somebody is having an affair, it may not be considered to be as immoral. Uh, but if somebody is having... Uh, corruption uh, that can be considered to be very, very immoral. So that depends upon the society also. Living relationship, for example, that may be considered to be moral. In uh, in, uh, in our Western countries, most of the Western countries, but it will be considered to be highly immoral in India. Then another very important determinant of ethics is law. Friends, the, 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 the difference between the right and wrong is basically uh, provided in the yeah, in the ethics and the moral values of the society, the traditions. But if you violate them, then there is no mechanism to punish the person. So what, what happens that over a period of time, something which is going to be bad becomes a law. And in the law, we, press, we, we provide punishment for violating those norms. So a government of a state uh, sometimes makes law and that prohibits certain action and allows certain action. So if you break those laws, if you do those actions which are prohibited actions, then you are punished. The law decides basically the concept of right and wrong for the citizen. Because something which is awarded or something which is allowed is legal and something which is punished is something which is considered to be illegal. And therefore, law guides the citizen to follow the right path because if you do what was considered to be illegal, then in the eyes of the society, you are moral, you are doing the right thing, you are ethical. But if you break the law, you are considered to be unethical. Like suppose somebody does corruption, it is against the law. 
it is considered to be illegal, it is considered to be immoral, it is considered to be unethical. Laws like Sati, prohibition of Sati played a very important role in stopping the Sati Pratha when it became a punishable offense. Uh, uh, then uh, gradually the Sati Pratha disappeared. Laws relating to intercaste and interreligious marriage, prohibition of the dowry, prohibition of divorce provision transformed the ethical values of the society. Because once you make something illegal, uh, something which was part of the custom, for example, dowry was part of the custom for decades and uh, centuries, but uh, once it is being uh, made illegal, then, uh, then, then uh, the people who are demanding dowry were punished, uh, and then uh, people stopped or gradually it stopped the tendency of giving dowry. In the same way, the Supreme Court orders re regarding 377 of the IPC, uh, which has uh, which has been declared unconstitutional, that has given boost to the LGBT right or the same-sex uh, relationship. Uh, similarly, the SC judgments on the triple talaq and the sabri mala that to will transform the social values of society in coming time. So laws can be made either by the parliament or sometime uh, the court also decide and the decision of the court also become the law and that basically transform the society. Now organizations also play a very very important role in determining our moral values. So every organization has a culture of its own and people mold their values according to the organization because there we want to succeed and we have to change. So, for example, uh, the employees of the government sectors, for politics, corporate, and public sector units vary. The ethical values of the police officer, for example, is different than that of the employee of the hospitality sector, like the aviation sector, like the uh, like the hotel industries. So they are different. I mean, if you are a police officer, you can't be uh, such uh, you know polite uh, and. Uh, you, you can't be polite to the criminals, you can't be polite that much to the people because you have to ultimately deal with the criminal. And so you have to be tough, you have to be ruthless, and then only you can become a good police officer. But if you join a government sector, uh, your values will be different. If you join the private sector, your values will be different. And if you join politics, your values will be different. So depending upon the organization which we prefer to join, our values change accordingly. Then religion also plays a very important role in the development of the values. Because most of the people are religious in nature and they believe in God. And so whatever is provided in their scripture, they follow. Whatever is prohibited in their scriptures, they avoid. All religions prescribe do's and don'ts to their followers. And most of the people, you know, follow that. For example, alcohol is prohibited in Islam, but permitted in Christianity. And that is why you will find that almost 90% or more people in uh, Muslims don't uh, drink alcohol. But uh, more 90% um, people of uh, Christians will be drinking alcohol because that is provided. Hinduism, for example, divides the pieces of caste in a rigid hierarchy. And so this caste system is very much prevalent uh, in our society. In the same way, divorce is not allowed in Hinduism, but it is permitted in Christianity and Islam. And so you will find that the divorce rate in India among the Hindus is less than 1%, but much higher in Christianity and Islam. In the same way, the Islam permits four marriages and uh, two for the males and uh, triple talaq and that also uh, determines the ethical values of the uh, of the people who are uh, following Islam. So please remember that uh, it all depends upon the religion also because religion is a matter of faith and something which is prohibited in the religion we don't want to do and so that also shapes our values. So religion is also one of the very important determinants of the ethical now finally we come to the time. The values are not, the ethical values are not frozen in time and space. They are changing with time. What was considered to be ethical say few hundred years ago, it is not considered to be ethical now. What was ethical in the ancient or medieval period is not considered to be ethical in the modern period. For example, it was ethical in the ancient time to conduct war in the uh, ancient and medium time, medieval time. For whatever reason, you know, but it is considered to be immoral in the modern time. So you are seeing the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, and you you will find that most of the world consider uh, the war waged by uh, Russia as wrong. But uh, in the earlier time, if the king was powerful, then he could uh, easily conduct war against other neighbors and win their territory. So this was something which was considered to be uh, moral uh, in the past, but it is not considered moral in the modern time. Earlier, for example, if somebody was gay, uh, it was considered to be very immoral and sometimes even the death sentence was awarded. 
but it is not considered to be moral in today's time. Earlier, it was considered to be unethical for a man or woman if they marry against the wishes of their parents, but it is considered to be ethical now. Earlier, you know, the children had to marry uh, according to the desire of their parents, uh, and if they marry against their wishes, it is considered to be immoral by the society. But today, the society permits. As a matter of fact, uh, parent earlier arranged the marriage of the children uh, even against their will. Uh, their will was never asked, you know, and it is not a long story, it is just a few decades ago. But if uh, the, today the parents force their children to marry, uh, this will be considered unethical. Friends, uh, the, the moral values and the ethical values also keep changing with time. What was considered to be moral in the past may not be considered moral today. And so we have to see that we don't uh, uh, copy the ancient values uh, because uh, uh, many things which were moral uh, earlier time are not moral today and many things which were not considered to be immoral may become moral. So friends, we discussed today uh, the different determinants, different factors which are responsible for the development of the ethical value. So it's dimensions of ethics, which can also be called branches of ethics. But before we proceed for this class, let us just recollect the concept of ethics which we have discussed earlier. Friends, ethics we know is deals with basic concepts and the fundamental principles of good human conduct. That basically means that what is right and what is wrong, that is what we, we learn in ethics. Here we study uh, the universal values that are necessary for living good life in this world. But ethics has multiple sources. For example, we also learn from religions as to what is right and what is wrong what is good and what is evil. But we are not given the reasons or logic for that because it is believed that the concept of right and wrong has been decided by God and it cannot change with time. But unlike the good and evil, bad and good, which is given in the religion, which is immutable, cannot be changed, when we discuss about ethics, the concept of right and wrong are not based on any divine source. It is based on logical discussions, evidence and investigations. So that means the concept of ethics or what is right and wrong is always open for discussion and it can always be challenged. And in fact, it is continuously challenged and that is why the concept of ethics keeps changing with time so what was considered ethical few centuries ago or few thousand years ago may not be considered ethical today. And what was considered unethical that time may be considered ethical today. Because it is something which is based on reason and logic. We learn from experience and then we keep changing the concept of that. Now, what are the dimensions of ethics? There are basically four dimensions. The first is called metaethics, which discusses the origin and meaning of ethics, how the ethics has come, what is the source of ethics. The second part is descriptive ethics, where we learn about the people's belief on morality. What is the concept of morality in the eyes of the people? So this is based on basically the empirical result and that also we are going to discuss today. Then the third important concept is normative ethics, which deals with the study of ethical action. As to what are, what are the criteria, how we can decide if something is ethical or not. And then the fourth important branch of ethics or dimension of ethics is applied ethics, where we examine the special, specific controversial issues and find out whether that particular action is ethical or not. So we are going to learn all the four uh, in our course. Today we are going to focus on metaethics and descriptive ethics. Uh, while giving you the brief of uh, normative ethics and applied ethics and thereafter we'll discuss in detail the concept of normative ethics and applied ethics in a separate class. Okay, so let us now start with the first important concept that is metaethics. Now metaethics is coined from two words, meta, which basically means beyond and ethics. That means what is beyond ethics? What is the mother of ethics? How ethics has originated. So this basically discusses about what is beyond ethics or why exist 
why ethics ex exist at all? Why should we be ethical? Well, what is what is the problem? And why we can't be unethical? What are the benefits for that? How the ethics has actually come into uh, being? So these are basically uh, the concepts. So metaethics basically is uh, about the study and origin and the meaning, a study of the origin and meaning of the ethical concept that is something which is discussed in the metaethics. Now this covers basically two issues. One is metaphysical issues and other is psychological issues. So let's understand both these concepts in detail. First is metaphysical issues in metaethics. Now metaphysical means uh, this particular types of issues or meta metaphysical part of metaethics is a division of philosophy which is concerned with the fundamental nature of reality and being. You see what happens that as the word appears to us is not the way actually the word operates. Sometimes we call it Maya also in our ancient philosophy. That means what is the appearance is not same as to what is the reality. So when we talk about the metaphysical issues, that means what we can see physically is not the same as the reality. So we go beyond the physical. We try to find out what is the reality behind what is physically seen. So that is basically the metaphysical issues and that deals with what is beyond the objective experience. Because these objective, these experiences may appear to be, you know, random, different, but if you go deeper into that, you will find that they are originating from some certain principles and those principles are basically dealt in the metaphysical. We can divide metaphysical issues further into two parts, absolutism and relativism. So let's understand both these concepts. First concept is absolutism. Absolutism basically means that these principles are absolute like the law of nature. So like, just like a soul is the essence of all the living being, according to this theory, uh, a soul is divine, we know, which is absolute and eternal also, we know. So according to this principle, the ethical principles too are universal, absolute, eternal, spiritual, otherworldly and divine like God. And these principles are created by God or nature. If you don't believe on God, you can call it nature. These principles simply exist like gravity. So we don't know who has created gravity, how the gravity was created, but we know that it exists. So in the same way, these ethical principles exist just like gravity, law of nature, and we can experience their presence, the presence of these principles in our soul, but we can't know the reason for their existence. For example, we can all experience gravity because it exerts force on us. But we don't know why it has been created, how it has been created. Those things we, we do not. In the same way, what happens is that when we do something good or bad, our conscience tells us whether the action is right or wrong. And that is basically uh, the, the, that these things are common in all the people. And that's why it's called absolutism because it's a universal experience. We realize their presence through the voice of our conscience, inner voice or voice of our soul. So suppose you are doing something unethical then your voice of soul will tell, don't do this. So that is something which is, uh, which we must avoid. In the same way, suppose we do something good, like we are going, uh, we are speaking truth, we are fighting for the principle, then we feel good. Our conscious encourages us to do such type of actions. And that is why it is said, and why, why this conscious behave, nobody knows. And so this is what this, is the, this principle believes, that it is because, you know, human nature is like that. So the concept of, the right and wrong or ethical concept is embedded into a human being. And Plato believed that divinity of the moral values and ethics because these are created by God and it cannot be changed. The Indian concept of dharma is also akin to the universality of the ethics. That means all the ethics are universal and they do not change with time and place. <coughs> But then every philosopher do not believe that the concept of ethics is uh, absolute. There are many philosophers who believe 
that actually the concept of ethics is human creation and it is only relative in nature. So they believe that ethics is this worldly and it is created by human mind only and hence it is very subjective. So the principle of relativism tells us that no, the, 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 the ethical values are not divine in nature but they are created by human beings and they exist because we have created it. That's why they keep on changing. They are not absolute and universal. That's why moral values keep changing from time, uh, from one society to another society. And also with respect. So they are, these people are often called skeptics because uh, they question all the moral values. Now the skeptics or the principles of relativism, they don't reject the moral values. They don't say that you should not speak truth or you should not be faithful. They don't say like, oh, you, you should be non-violent. Those things they don't say. But what they say basically is that these are not divine creation. These are created because of the logic, reasons, and so it can be changed depending upon the situation. So they don't reject the moral value because that is the best thing to do and that is that gives us the long-term benefit. But they deny that spirituality or divinity is of moral value, but they don't believe that it is created by God and therefore it cannot be changed. So any moral principle, uh, if you feel that this moral principle uh, is uh, not acceptable in a particular situation, then you can change. That is what is the principle of relativism. Uh, this position is uh, often called moral relativism and there are two distinct forms of moral relativism also. What are those? The first concept is called individual relativism. That means the moral concepts are related to every individual. And individuals create their own moral standards. And the individual morality basically depends upon what suits you best. So a person who is a poor person, his moral standard cannot be expected to be the same as the person who is rich. The moral standards of a man, for example, may be different from the moral standards of a woman. Because it depends upon the individual. German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche he believed that great people create their own moral values and they are quite distinct from and in reaction to the slave life values of the masses. So the people, so the moral values of the great people, the heroes, are not the same as the moral values of the poor people or the masses or the, or, or the people. Because in the society you require some people to be masters, some people to be slave, or some people to be, uh, you know, uh, the ruler, or some people to be subject. And so the same moral value will not be applicable to everyone. And so depending upon the situation, whether you are poor or rich, whether you are a ruler or a subject, your moral value will change. The other uh, type of relativism says it's cultural relativism. That means basic principle of morality is decided by the society through evolutionary process. And moral principles that need the approval of a society. For example, uh, let us say uh, wearing a dress. So uh, if you are in India and you wear a short dress, uh, then it will not be considered to be good. Uh, but if you are in uh, Western countries, uh, then it will not be considered to be immoral. Uh, so uh, it all depends. Um, in India, for example, somebody who is having a premarital marital sex or a pair, that will be considered to be wrong. But uh, perhaps it will not be considered to be so much immoral uh, if you are in Western countries. So these, these things we have to understand that uh, a lot depends upon uh, uh, the culture also. Uh, so, uh, this moral principle, uh, it says the culture of uh, uh, relativism. So, if you are born in India, you will have a different set of values. And you, if you are born in America, for example, or Europe, you may have a different set of values. The second important thing is the psychological issues in metaphysics. So, we discuss about the metaphysical issues. Now, let's come to the psychological issues. In psychological is uh, issues, uh, we try to find out the psychological benefits psychological reasons for being ethical or unethical. And here we learn why do some people behave morally and others are immoral when they are brought up in the same society and often in the same family. So if something is good, for example, gravity is not going to change depending upon the person. But here we see that, you know, some people who are in the same family or same department or same society, same organization, some people can be ethical and some people can be unethical. So here we, we, we ask the question, that whether the uh, being ethical is a matter of faith or it is based on certain reasoning. So here we learn in the psychological issue, why should we be moral? 
Are we moral because it gives us certain benefits like happiness, honors, or, or connect with the people? For example, uh, many people will say that, look, I speak truth because when I speak truth, I feel good. And when I speak lie, uh, uh, I don't feel good. So if you are faithful, you feel good. If you are unfaithful, you don't feel good. You feel bad. And so that's a psychological. So psychologically basically means that we are moral because it gives us certain benefits. Or we are moral because we want to avoid punishment, social isolation and hatred from fellow human beings. That means it could be on the basis of reason that we know that if we do uh, corruption or if we do unfaithfulness, then maybe we'll have a punishment from the society. And that is the reason that we try to be moral. And there are many psychological factors of morality. Uh, there we can divide them into four uh, parts, egoism, altruism, emotions and reason. So let's learn about all the four psychological factors of morality. <laughs> first of all, the first psychological factor is for egoism. Egoism, this word egoism comes from the word ego, which basically means I. And the meaning of the egoism is that all human beings are inherently selfish and they do something, whatever they do, they do because that pleases them. Even when they are helping other people, for example, we are doing charity or doing social work, the real purpose is basically to please ourselves. So, for example, uh, if uh, giving charity doesn't please you, you don't feel good about doing charity, you will not do. So, this egoism principle says that all the actions people do is basically because that action makes them feel good. And if that ego is not satisfied, if the person interest is not satisfied, then they will not do it. The second uh, theory in the psychological uh, concept is altruism. Altruism says that no, we are not human beings. All human beings are not uh, selfish in nature. We are basically social animal and we can't enjoy anything alone. We need to interact with the people and we feel good when we are, we are doing good for the people. Because we have a natural tendency or natural ability of empathy and sympathy by which we connect with other people very naturally. For example, when you see that there is a, some injustice going to the in the world, Muslim people are treated unfairly, um, a poor person is uh, persecuted, um, a rich person is doing wrong things, or a powerful person is misusing his power, then we feel pain of the victim. We cry when other people cry and we laugh when other people laugh. And that's why there is a beautiful uh, Swedish proverb which says, shared joy is a double joy, shared sorrow is half sorrow. So this particular uh, concept says that uh, it is a human nature that uh, when we share our joy, it, it is double and when we share our sorrow, it's half sorrow. And that's why we have a natural tendency to share our uh, happiness with other people and also share the happiness and pain of other people. So altruism basically means that man has an inherent capacity to show benevolence or goodness or uh, you know helping other people. A benevolence to others means helping other people. And it is considered to be great value, a virtue in many cultures and core respect of many religious traditions and secular uh, people worldwide. Because in every religion, in every tradition, in every concept, you know, if you are helping other people, it's considered to be a good action. And why it comes, this theory says that because it is a human nature, we have a natural empathy and sympathy. And so whenever we try to help other people, that makes us feel good. The third important concept uh, of psychological uh, reason is emotions. It says that moral assessments involve our emotions and not our reason. Even though uh, the ethics is considered to be based on reason, but this particular theory says that no, it is basically based on our emotions. Uh, we do uh, what, we, what feels good to us. And you must have found that, you know, when you do some good action, when you help the people, you feel good about that. And that's why you do it. So, this particular theory says that uh, there is a there is an emotional reason for doing good. Because when you do good things, you feel good. And then after we discover the reason to justify our emotion. Uh, Hume has rightly said, reason is not to be the slave of passion. That means that emotions come first, the passion comes first, and then comes the reason. <laughs> And therefore, this theory says that the main reason why we do the right thing 
is because when we do the right thing, we feel good. But on the other side, there is also another theory which says that reason is important for doing something. Many philosophers like M. Vulkan believe that emotions are not enough to justify our actions because moral actions are basically based on reasons. For example, if you are not doing corruption, it is not that you may not feel good by doing corruption, but because you know that if you do corruption, maybe you will be prosecuted, maybe you can be arrested. If you are unfaithful, it is not because being unfaithful means uh, it is bad, but because you know that if you are caught, then you can be punished and you can be outcasted by your family and the society. So reason basically says that all the moral actions are derived from reason. It, is, it also says that emotions are basically subjective and temporary. They keep on changing with uh, time and place and the person. So if you are basically uh, trying to be ethical uh, because of uh, emotions, then you cannot be ethical for a long time because emotions are very, very subjective and they're very temporary. On the contrary, the reasons are objective and last long, so people know you. And then those those are based on reason that can have a longish life. And so if you, uh, only reason, you know, is responsible for uh, ethical uh, action. So this particular says, uh, the concept says that true ethic, ethics is uh, guided by reason rather than emotion. So friends, all the four uh, concepts, all the four concepts, if you look at it, we have learned that, you know, there are four principles, egoism, altruism, emotions, and reason. In metaphysical, we learn there is concept of absolutism, relativism, like dharma and vice of soul is absolutism. Relativism, we have individual and cultural relativism. In the psychological, all the four concepts, in my opinion, all the four concepts are important for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for our ethical action. When we do ethical action, we feel good. We also make other people happy, we get emotional satisfaction. At the same time, the same action is also justifiable on the basis of reason. So all the four factors basically contribute uh, psychologically to, for the ethical act. Now let us uh, go to the next important branch of ethics, which is called descriptive ethics or comparative ethics. Now, so far we have learned the ethical values which are based on reason. Now, Descriptive ethics actually does not talk about the cause and all that. We try to find out what people consider ethical in a particular society at a particular time. So it is, it is the study of people's belief about morality. And this is based on the empirical research into the attitude of the individual or groups to ascertain what people consider moral. For example, uh, in this method, we conduct a survey of uh, particular uh, of people in the society uh, where we collect the sample and try to find out if they consider, let us say, uh, um, uh, let us say, living relationship, whether they consider it ethical or not. So, uh, if you conduct such a survey in India, perhaps most of the people say living relationship is not ethical. But uh, if you conduct the survey in America, we may say that uh, it is not unethical; it is ethical. So that tells us what the society consider ethical or unethical. So it basically investigate the actions which society reward or punish. So in India, for example, if somebody is living, uh, uh, having living relationship, uh, that they may be punished or boycotted. But uh, the same is not uh, true in case of uh, America. In the same way, suppose somebody does a charity, then perhaps uh, he will be appreciated uh, by most of the people in every society. So that was action can be considered as ethical. The concept of uh, you know, ethics uh, is dynamic. It keeps changing with time and place. So what is uh, what was ethical 100 years ago may not be considered ethical today. What is considered ethical in India may not be considered ethical in Europe. And what is considered ethical in Delhi may not be considered ethical in remote place of India or in a rural India. So this is a method which is based on empirical study. And here we try to find out what people consider ethical. We provide a very authentic information about what is considered ethical by the society. Now, descriptive ethics also has a very important role to play in ethics because uh, here we actually try to find out what the society says consider ethical or not. And we have earlier learned that ultimately the concept of ethics is related to the culture and tradition of the society. So it is a very authentic ma method of finding out what is the what are the actions which are considered to be ethical by the society. 
So once the philosopher, uh, by following this method, ascertain what is ethical from society's point of view, they can find out the reason also to justify the prevalent behavior. So they have to rediscover the reason. Once they know that, for example, living is considered to be ethical, then they have to find out the reasons why it is considered to be ethical. And so they will come up with a new theory. So this will help the philosopher coming with newer theories of ethics and that are in tune with the so descriptive ethics basically involves the empirical investigation and hence, and therefore it is used in different scientific methods, uh, fields like evolutionary biology, psychology, sociology, and anthropology because it follows the scientific principle. Okay, third important uh, principle is normative ethics. Normative ethics is basically the study of ethical action. And here we deal with the issue of ethical dilemma and uh, investigate the set of questions that arise while considering how one ought to act morally in a given situation. Ethical dilemmas uh, are the situation when we have to choose two even two ethical means and uh, we don't know which one is to be right or not. And that's why it's sometimes called prescriptive also rather than descriptive because it tells us how to act morally and what moral it is. And we will learn more about the normative ethics in, in a separate class, in a separate video. Now the fourth important branch of ethics is applied ethics which is connected with the analysis of particular moral issues in public and private life. So here we try to find out, you know, what in, in a larger scale, at the societal scale, at the organizational scale, what are the actions which are considered to be moral and what are the actions which are immoral. So in the private life, in the public life, what are the moral and immoral actions that we study? And it deals with controversial moral issues such as abortion, animal rights, and euthanasia. And these type of actions uh, we study in detail. And we are going to have a separate class for applied ethics also. So friends, today we have learned about all the four dimensions of ethics. Two dimensions we will learn in detail. The remaining two dimensions, that is the concept of normative ethics and applied ethics, we will learn more in detail in the subsequent class. Friends, we have learned earlier about the dimensions of ethics. And there we learned about normative ethics. So now we are going to learn about normative ethics in detail. Normative ethics is basically the study of ethical action. That means how, what are the criteria on the basis of which we can decide if action is ethical or not. It deals with the ethical dilemma. And here we try to investigate the questions that arising that arises when we consider how one ought to act morally in a given situation. Now, what is ethical dilemma? Ethical dilemma is sometimes called ethical paradox also. Because it is a decision-making problem between two or more possible moral imperative or choices, neither of which is unambiguously acceptable or preferable. Let us assume that, you know, there is a boy who is chased by criminals for kidnapping. And that boy has come and he has hidden behind a tree. So there is a tree behind that he has hidden. Now the kidnappers comes and ask you, have you seen the boy? Now in this situation, what you should do? Should you speak the truth and say that yes, the boy is hidden over there? If you do that, then the kidnapper will kidnap that boy, maybe demand extortion and maybe they will kill the boy. So, you have the choice. Should you speak truth? Or should you speak lie? You want to speak truth. But here if you speak truth, the consequence can be that the boy may be killed or kidnapped. But suppose you lie and you say you have not seen the boy. Maybe the kidnapper will go back and the boy's life will be protected. So here you have to choose between two ethical principles. One is speaking truth. And other is saving life or the principle of benevolence. Both are important. We would like to choose both. That means we should have 
He wanted to save the life of the boy and also to save, to speak the truth. But when the situation is such that we can't do both, then we have to choose what is more important to us. And in this situation, as we can see, and that it is important for saving the life of the boy, and so it would be better to speak lie, sacrifice that principle of his speaking truth, and choose the principle of saving life because that is more important. So this is basically what is studied in normative ethics. What are the different principles on the basis of which we can decide if a particular action is ethical or not? It is sometimes called prescriptive rather than descriptive because it tells us how to act morally rather than what morality is. Because these principles are already prescribed by different philosophers. And so we say according to such and such principle, this is what we should do. So that's why it is called prescriptive and not descriptive because we are not going to conduct a survey and then on the basis of survey, whatever people say will do. No. It is basically based on reason and certain principles and that's why we call it prescriptive. There are basically four types of normative ethical principles. Virtue ethics, deontology, consequentialism, or ethics of care or relationship, relational ethics. So let us learn about all the four principles. The first important principle is called virtue ethics. It is the oldest school of philosophy. About ethics. Here, the focus is not on the specific action, but on the inherent character of the person who is carrying out that action. So, our actions, it says, this theory says that it is the manifestation of our inner self. If you are a good person, you will do good action. If you are a bad person, your action can't be good, it will be bad. And the best example is the movies. In the movies, you must see that the hero Sometimes breaks the law, sometimes lie, sometimes even beat his boss or even the politician, sometimes even commit a murder. But we all clap because we know that the hero is good. And so whatever he is doing is basically the right thing to do. So virtue ethics basically means that you should be having certain virtues. And once you have the virtues, whatever action you decide to take in a given situation, that action will be means that if you are a virtuous person, all your actions shall be ethical. Just like the hero, a virtuous person always do the right thing. Now what are the virtues? We will learn very soon. And this concept has been given in Bible also, where it is said that for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does bad tree bear good fruit, for every tree is known by its own fruit. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of treasure, evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So this principle basically says that if you are a good person, your actions will be good because it's natural that a good person do the good thing. And if you are evil, then all your actions will be bad. Now, how do we identify what are the virtues or who is a virtuous person? For that, the oldest school of thought, which is popular even today, is about the four cardinal virtues, which has been given Plato, and it has also been supported by different philosophers later on. These four cardinal virtues are prudence or wisdom. This means ability to discern the appropriate course of action to be given in the given situation at the appropriate time. That means if you are wise, if you have the prudence, you will do the right thing at the right time. So a person who have, has the prudence, you must have seen that in the movies and all that, and in the scriptures, the hero chooses different action depending upon the situation. So like Lord Krishna, for example, he has modified the principle or used a different principle when it was to kill Bhisma or Drona or God or even Duryodhana because he wanted to ensure the victory of Dharma. And so he knew that Bhishma cannot be defeated in the state battles and so he chose a method. 
So a wise person knows that in the given situation, what is the ethical action. The second important quality in a virtuous person is courage. That is the ability to confront fear, uncertainty and intimidation. No person can have can be called virtuous if he doesn't have courage. So you should be in a position to take the risk for the principles. If you don't have the courage, all other virtues are useless. The third important principle is temperance. A virtuous person must have temperance. That means he should be able to temper his desires, control his desires and appetite. Appetite basically means the physical desires of physical appetite like sex and food and all that. You should have control over that. Not that you have to avoid it, but you have to control it, limit it. Do as much as required and not excess of that. And finally, justice. A virtuous person must have justice. It must be fair and righteous. If you don't have the sense of justice, you can't be virtuous. All these four qualities are required in the virtuous person. And you can identify almost all the four qualities in every hero which we see in the movies or in the mythologies. And if you have these qualities, all your actions will be good. That's what the theory of virtues is. The second important principle, normative principle, is called dentology. Dentology is derived from the Greek word beyond, which basically means obligation or duty. And this principle says that an action should be just based on the laws and rules. It means we should follow the rules and laws. Not what it is going to lead, but what actually is law that we should follow. So suppose you are supposed to speak truth, then you should always speak truth in respect to the situation. If you have to be faithful, you should be always faithful in respect to the situation. That means following the laws and rules is what is the ethical act. There is also sometimes called duty or obligation or rule-based ethics because the rules bind you to your duty. And the decision here must be made based on one's duties and one's rights. So whatever your duties are, you should do and you should also see that you follow your rights and also the rights of other people. You protect the rights of other people. And this theory has been largely attributed to Emil Kant and we will talk more about that uh, a little later. He was considered to be one of the greatest philosophers of all time. And here, most important thing is action is more important than the consequence. That means what is the consequence is not in your control. So right action has to be and this is most important for the civil services because your actions should always be in accordance with the rules and laws of the country. A civil servant, most important thing is that you should follow the rules and laws. As long as you are following it, you are doing the right thing. Dentology ethics also has basically three categories. The Varical Imperative, Gantan Ethics and Nishkam Karma. So let's understand all the three principles. <laughs> First is called Categorical Imperative. Uh, this is a theory which was given by Immul Kant and this theory says that morality is based on humanity's rational capacity. That means all human beings are basically rational <laughs> and on the basis of that they can decide what is right and what is wrong and then whatever is rationally right or what principles has been rationally derived that must be followed all the time. So, he believed that all moral principles can be derived using rational thinking. And then he has given the concept of categorical imperative, which is an absolute unconditional requirement that must be obeyed in all circumstances and should be justified at the end itself. That means categorical imperatives are those commands which are to be followed in all the situations. It is unconditional. You cannot change those principles depending upon the situation. So according to this principle, one must act only according to the maxim, whereby you can at the same time build that it should become a universal law. For example, speaking truth. Now you can make speaking truth as universal law, so that is ethical. But you can't make speaking lies as universal law, and therefore this is unethical. Ethical action is basically something which can be universalized, which we can follow all the time. So, like, one should always speak the truth irrespective of the consequence because speaking truth can be said to be a categorical imperative, which can be followed in all the situations which comes before us. 
The second types of this concept of bentology is Gandhi ethics. <laughs> and this is based on Mahatma Gandhi's principle. Mahatma Gandhi believed that on the righteousness of the action. That means action should be right and not the consequence of that action. He believed that noble ends cannot be achieved by following evil means because there is opposite theory which says that end is what is most important. If the end is good, everything is good. But Gandhiji was not in favor. According to him, the means are most important. You cannot use the wrong means to achieve the right ends. He said, they say means are after all. Means, I would say, means are after all. Everything as is the means, so is the end. He believed that we must always follow the right things. We cannot achieve the good end by following the wrong means. And so he believed in the primacy of the action. And he believed that truth and non-violence are non-negotiable and immutable because they have to be followed in all situations. The third important ontology principle is sometimes called Niskam Karma. Niskam Karma basically sometimes can also be said to be selfless action or action without any particular desire. Self-interest action. There is no self-interest in that. In Gita, Lord Krishna says, you have a right to perform your prescribed duties, but you are not entitled to the fruits of your action. You should never consider yourself to be the cause of the result of your activities, nor be attached to inaction. You must be steadfast in the performance of your duty, abandoning attachment of success of your job. So what it means is that you should always do your duty. You should not avoid doing something or your duties because it is going to lead to harm to you. And you should not do any unethical act because it is going to benefit you. So it's so your personal success or failure, your personal benefits, personal difficulties are not important. That should not become the criteria for doing the action. You should see that if the action is right, action is ethical, you must always do that. So Nishkam Karm basically emphasizes the performance of one's duty rather than working for the result of the action. That's why Lord Krishna asked Arjun to fight because that was his duty. Whether he wins or lose, whether he survive or die, that's not important. Because as, as a chhatri, as, as a king, as a preserver of dharma, he must fight and that is why this is called Nishkam Karma. That means when you are doing something, it is not because you are going to gain something out of it, but because that is the right thing to do. The third important principle is called consequentialism or teleology. Now, this particular word, teleology, is derived from Greek word telos, which means end, goal, or purpose, or logos, but means reasons or explanation. That means the morality of an action depends upon the outcome or result of action. Now, this particular theory is opposite or different from the dentology principle. It says that ethicality of the action or the ethical value of action. Depends not on what actually you do, but what it produces. It is the end result of that action. So he believed that ends are more important than the means. So if the end is good, everything is good. And the most important ethical principle of teleology is utilitarianism, which basically means that an action is ethical which provides the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. So utilitarian is a principle which says that any action which pleases largest number of people, that is basically an ethical action. Even if suppose you lie, but if lie makes most people happy, that will be considered ethical according to teleology principle. And it is most relevant for the political leader as they have to please as many people as possible because their survival and their success depends on the votes. And that's why this particular principle is most important for the politician. And finally, we have the ethics of care or relational ethics. This is also sometimes called the feminine ethics. This was founded by feminist theorist, who is mainly Carol Galligan. Galligan. Now, she says basically that morality arises out of the experience of empathy and compassion. Now you must have seen that the woman in our family, the mother for example, 
has a very different way of dealing the things. While the typical philosopher or the law deals the things in a mechanical manner, suppose somebody has done wrong, he must be punished according to the law which is well prescribed. But as far as the mother is concerned, she does not provide a mechanical punishment or mechanical reward for the actions. Suppose the child has done something wrong, then she may punish the child. She may sometimes scold, sometimes may try to persuade also. And sometimes she may punish herself by not speaking to the child, by skipping the meal, taking fast, or not eating anything. Because ultimately she wants the child to change because she is having empathy and compassion for the child and she doesn't want to harm the child. If suppose the child commits a mistake and the child is beaten or handed over to police, that may be according to the law. What? That will spoil the career of the child, life of the child. So this particular concept says that we should deal with the people the way we deal with our family member or loved ones. Because we must try to create a better society must try to transform it. And this concept emphasizes the importance of interdependence and relationship in achieving ethical goals. And here we discuss as to how the relationships are basically connected with each other, how we are connected with each other. So instead of, you know, doing it mechanically as if we have got nothing to do with the person who has committed wrong or right, we must connect that person emotionally and have an empathy and compassion for that and see what is the right action in the given situation which can change that particular person and make him a good person. It's not only that famous, famous follow that Buddha, Jesus Christ, Mahatma Gandhi, they all followed this type of principle. Where instead of punishing the people, they sometimes punish themselves. What they will do forgives the person sometimes because their ultimate purpose is to reform the person. The ethical action is one that nurture relationship and strengthen the family and the society. That is the basic principle of ethics of care. And that is how the females generally change the society and they generate love and affection in the society. And today we are going to discuss the concept of applied ethics. We have earlier learned about the different dimensions of ethics. And there we learn the four dimensions of ethics. We have already discussed the three dimensions in detail and now we are going to discuss the concept of applied ethics. That's what is applied ethics. Applied ethics is sometimes also called practical ethics. Because we have learned about the different principles of ethics, how to use that in the practical life so that we can make a better world. It is basically the concept of application of ethics in, to solve the real world problems. And applied ethics is concerned with the analysis of particular moral issues in private and public life. So here we study the issue in detail, not from the individual's perspective. Things are not decided for individual, but things are decided at the larger scale. And here we try to answer the questions how the people should act in a specific situation. Now there are three basically requirements for applied ethics. First, the issue should be controversial in nature. The second is that there should be moral dimensions of the, the issue. And third, that this particular issue must substantially impact the society. So all the three dimensions are important. If suppose there is a particular ethical issue or ethical dilemma that affects only a very small number of people, then it will not be in that category of applied ethics. Applied ethics basically means three criteria, controversial, moral and substantial impact of the society. So besides having substantial effect on the society, first requirement as I said is that it should be controversial. The issue in ethical or applied ethics must be controversial. And what are the issues which are controversial? Where significant number of people are for, a significant number of people are against that issue which is in hand. For example, if you talk about issues like theft, murder and rape, these are all moral issues. They should not be done. Theft cannot be said to be moral. Theft is immoral, murder is immoral, rape is immoral. 
but they are not controversial because almost everybody will say that theft is wrong, murder is wrong, rape is wrong. All these issues are almost admitted by everyone as immoral. And so, not that substantial number of people are supporting a substantial number against that. So, this is non-controversial issue and therefore it is not the field of applied ethics. <laughs> so, murdering the people using gun is not applied ethics because murder is wrong and anybody who commits murder is doing an unethical act. But what is of applied ethic domain is whether the gun control should be there or not. Because there we have controversy. There we have controversy. Some people believe that it is my life and I have the life of, I have the right of self-defense. So if I feel that there is a threat to my life, I must be able to defend my life and therefore I should be able to buy guns just like I buy anything else. On the other side, people say no. The guns should be controlled. It should be given only when the government or the authorities are convinced that actually you have a right or a threat of life. <laughs> so these two school of thoughts are very, very divergent. And there is substantial number of people who will say gun control should be there. And similarly, you will find a lot of people will say no, it should be left to the individual. And that's why in America, you see, for example, that gun control law is not there. Anybody can go and buy a gun if he feels that the gun is required. But in India, you can see that gun control is very much there. And here, it is very difficult in India to get the license for gun. As a result, people say, why should the state decide whether I should take gun or not? <laughs> so this is a controversial issue. So killing the people using a gun is not applied ethics because it is non-controversial. But whether the gun control should be there or not, that is something which is of applied ethics because it is controversial. The second thing is that there are certain issues like reservation, affirmative action, public versus private healthcare system or energy conservation. These issues are controversial. For example, some people say reservation is good, some people say reservation is bad, and both are both are both both sides, large number of people are there. Some people support affirmative action, some will not. In the same way, some people say that there should be same health care available to everybody. Why should the rich people have better health care? While some people say, look, government cannot afford to provide good health care to all the people. So, why should the rich people be devoid of a good health care if they have money? Or it can be said that, why should government decide which type of healthcare you want, let the people decide themselves. In the same way, energy conservation. Some people say, let us say that they, they, they rationalize the energy. But some people say, look, if you can pay for energy, you can take it. So these are controversial issues. And they also have a substantial impact on the society. But they are not having a moral dimension because they are basically the state policy. So these are the issues of the social policy which may help make a better society and therefore they are not part of the applied ethics. They are controversy. Also affect a large number of people, but they are not applied ethics. So we don't study the issues like reservation or affirmative actions in applied ethics. What are the different dimensions of applied ethics or the branches of applied ethics? <laughs> like medical ethics. Here, different issues are there. For example, genetics. For example, the issues like euthanasia, whether somebody wants to die, he has the right to die or not. There are so many issues which are controversial in nature, which are dealt here. Abortion issue. Business ethics is also dealt in applied ethics. What type of business practices are fair? Should people have the right to hire and fire? What type of ethical issues should be followed in advertisement? Labor laws. These are basically the business ethics. Environmental ethics should we cut trees, how many trees we should cut for the development, because development is important, but at the same time, environment protection is also very important. Both has to go hand in hand. 
So you must have found that whenever there is a development project, some people will opt it because it is going to cut trees, it's going to displace people. So that's basically something which is a controversial issue. <laughs> Same with sexual ethics. The issues like uh, extramarital affair, premarital affair, premarital sex, gay rights, LGBTQ, all these issues are basically part of the sexual ethics. And then there are human rights ethics. Where you must have seen that when the terrorist is killed or a bulldozer is, you know, uh, used for against the people who break the law uh, or against the rioters, alleged the rioter, then some people say, well, well, it is all right. These people have volatile dollar, these are criminals, so rules should not apply to them. Rules will take years for getting him punished. We should go for extra legal matters. Then some people say, look, Everybody should be given the protection of law. Everybody should follow the same rules. So that's basically human rights. That everybody, every human being is same. And every human being has rights that should be protected by the state. Now, in order to decide the ethicality of the applied ethics, there are certain norm normative principles. We are going to discuss the 10 normative principles which are used in applied ethics. First is the personal benefit. This acknowledges the extent to which an action produces the beneficial consequence for the individual in question. Now, if I do something, I must get certain benefits. If I'm working hard, and if I don't get any personal benefit, why should I work hard? So suppose I develop a medicine, I develop a formula, <laughs> then I must have the Right, IPR rights, intellectual property rights. It is not that I develop something with so much effort and society can use it, government can use it, which whatever price they give. Because I have taken risk, I have worked hard. So I, I need to derive personal benefit. <laughs> but then there is a social benefit also is involved. It acknowledges to the extent which an action produces the beneficial consequence for the society. Now, let us say that I develop a medicine for COVID-19 and the COVID-19 is pandemic is at the peak in around the world. And I say, look, I'm going to sell the medicine only at uh, or the vaccine only at $100. So that can be an action which will make me billionaire, multi-billionaire in no time. But will that be ethical? Because should we not consider the social benefit? So the idea is that whenever you do an action, Action must produce personal benefits, but it must also produce social benefits. You cannot take an action which is only producing personal benefit and it is also not right to expect people to do the actions purely for the society without having any benefit for their own. Both things has to go hand in hand. The third principle is called principle of beneficence, benevolence. That means we must help the people who are in need. We must try to do good to other people. So the person who does good to other people is ethical. And there is a principle of paternalism. <laughs> principle of paternalism basically means we must try to assist those people and pursue their best interests when they cannot do themselves. For example, the children. When the children are young, they don't have the ability to take care of themselves. And as a parent, we do take care of them. The same way in the society also you will find that there are a lot of poor people, old people, who cannot take care of themselves. And they are the segment of the society which can take care of them, or you can take care of them. And it is the responsibility of them to take care of the people who cannot take care of themselves. So this is what is called principle of paternalism, very useful for solving the case study. Then principle of harm, which says that, okay, maybe we cannot do benevolence, maybe we can't help other people, maybe we can't follow paternalism, but at least we must follow the principle of harm. That means at least we should not harm other people. At least that much we must do. So this is another very important principle that we must not harm other people principle of harm. The sixth principle is called principle of honesty. 
that means we should not deceive other we should not commit fraud we should not commit corruption we should be truthful honest that is what is ethical action then there is a principle of lawfulness that means whatever laws are provided in the society we must follow that law because the laws are like a social contract and this is the cost we have to pay to live in the society so you can't say that this law does not suit me or i am not convinced about this law and so i will not follow it now this full of lawfulness is that we must follow the law we should not violate it then we have principle of autonomy which acknowledges the person's freedom over his fact or her actions of or physical body here we want that people should decide their action themselves and they should not be acted they should not be used as a slave so as a parent we must try to give freedom to the children to use their career to study to decide of their own as a senior officer we must give freedom to our subordinates as a government we must give freedom to the common people that they must decide what is in their best interest not that we must dictate the terms to them then there is a ninth principle which is called principle of justice it basically means that we should ensure justice to every person every person should be treated with just it acknowledges the person's right to due process fair compensation for the harm which has been done to him and a fair distribution of benefit so every person has a due process of law every person has the right that if we want to give any reward or punishment we must follow the rules and procedures if some harm has been done to any person there must be a fair compensation of that if the government is distributing the benefit or if we are distributing the benefit to people we must fairly distribute the benefit and not do partiality in that regard <laughs> and finally the rights this is also very important normative principle of applied ethics it means it acknowledges the person's right to life information privacy free expression and safety every person has right to life we must protect that right we must provide the right information to the people we must protect the privacy of the people because privacy is a right fundamental right for everyone so if something has been told to us in private we must not reveal to the public we should not get into the domain or the life of other people allow the people to have their privacy free expression the people should be able to express their thought freely because that's again a fundamental right and everybody should be provided safety because safety is also one of the very important right whether it's a job safety or whether the safety of your home or like that all these rights are also to be protected so these are the 10 normative principles which are used in the applied ethics using that we choose what is the ethical action sometimes these principles conflict with each other we come across ethical dilemma and then we choose which which our principle is more important in the given situation for example development is important because that's very important for many others but at the same time the protection of environment is also important and so we have to choose which is a better principle because both are actually for many persons so friends we learned about applied ethics we subscribe to this channel to learn more about ethics and click that bell icon we'll be posting many more interesting videos on this course thank you